time, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Michael Kuzner, and his topic will be on integrative medicine. Thank you, Dr. Kuzner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks uh, uh, for the invitation. It's always great uh, to be involved with uh, David's Dream Foundation. Um, it's, uh, and it's interesting to be talking on the, on the topic of uh, integrative uh, oncology and integrative medicine. I usually wear two hats in my office. I am the uh, division chief and uh, also co-director of uh, GI malignancies at Sinai, but uh, on the other hand, I also did two years of training of uh, integrative uh, medicine, which is what we're gonna be talking today. So I, I think that when we're talking about what's the topic in hand, it, it's almost like to say that there's a lot of irresponsible people working, so we gotta come with a warning about this. And part of the problem is that when we talk about treating patients in general, this is not just oncology and not gastric cancer, but in general, the, this goes all the way back to Greek medicine and um, even modern medicine, when uh, we used to believe that we all have healing nature within ourselves. And then the second, on the modern side, it's uh, on the top of the slide, that it's treating the patient as a whole. It's not a matter of treating just the disease. And uh, that's been said in many different ways, but the truth is that this is what we're gonna be discussing. Now, what is integrative oncology? And the reason that I like to call it integrative oncology and integrative medicine and not just alternative or anything like that is because when we look at the way that the National Institute of Health has defined this, and there is an institute at the National Institute of Health. So when I put grants uh, and things like that, we could apply for grant research and all this in the National Cancer Institute, but as part of the N National Institute of Health, there is actually a complementary and alternative medicine institute in the National Institute of Health. It's uh, the same as the branch as the, as the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and the way that they define it is as a diverse group of uh, medical healthcare system practices that are not presently considered part of the conventional medicine. So I don't tend to like this definition that well because I don't like to call alternative medicine altogether. I really think that it should be much more on the complementary. And the reason is because alternative means that you're not using the standard. And this is a picture that actually, believe it or not, is here locally in Florida of a place that it has an alternative funeral home. And I think that alternative medicine will likely take you to an alternative funeral home. You need to be with the science. We need to complement it and we need to integrate it. And the graph to the right of the slide is a study in which it's proven that patients that undergo just alternative medicine compared to scientifically proven methods tend to have a, lo a lesser survival than the patients that integrate and complement, okay? So don't get me wrong, we're not going to be talking of just using alternative medicine. We're gonna be talking over the next uh, 40 minutes and hopefully leave some time for questions on the complement of what we can do to put all this together. Part of the problem is that we're spending a lot of money in medicine, and we need to figure out how to do this better. Because if we continue to just use everything on the scientific level and not use what is at hand with some other techniques, we're gonna be missing a lot. Now, the way that I like to call integrative medicine is just using every appropriate therapy, conventional and alternative together to facilitate the body's innate healing response. So we're neither rejecting conventional medicine or accepting alternative medicine in an uncritical fashion, okay? We're using our knowledge and scientific techniques to use both of them. And in oncology, the way that we define it, it is that same on a patient living with or beyond cancer because we need to talk about our survivors. We are having, thankfully, an epidemic of cancer survivors, which is great. Because the way that cancer is going to be treated in the future, and I always tell this to my patients, we don't cure high blood pressure. So you gotta get that out of your mind. When a patient comes to me and they tell me like, oh, I also have high blood pressure. 
they're being treated for high blood pressure. If they stop the pills that they take for high blood pressure, the high blood pressure will come back. The same way in the future is likely that we're going to have a lot of patients that are going to be chronically living with cancer and that we may not tell them like you're cured, that's okay, but you're being treated for cancer. And that's what we need to do when I say beyond cancer, that the patients may not be um, completely cured. Now, this goes back to the first slide that everyone has a doctor in him or her. We just need to help them work. And we just need to get that natural healing force that is within all of us to get well, okay? And why are people using all this complementary and alternative medicine? Many reasons. We did that survey a few years ago that was initially done by a group at, M at MD Anderson. I uh, replicated the survey at our cancer center and the results were absolutely equal. The reason that I did the, uh, the study here is because we have in Florida um, different uh, cultural groups. We have a lot of immigrants. We have a lot of Hispanic. The people that they were seeing at the major academic centers like MD Anderson was a little bit different. And that's the reason that we wanted to see if people were using it for the same reasons. And look at the last line. That's concerning when 13% of the patients are using alternative medicine because their regular medicine is too expensive. That, that's not acceptable in this state and age. But there's very few that are using it because we as medical professionals are suggesting them. And you'll see that it's not that difficult to suggest them. Now, we're not talking about this. A lot of the patients come to me and talk to me about Latril. Latril is also so-called vitamin B17. I'm not saying anything about good or bad, but I don't think that this is the type of place that I would like to go and get my medical care, <laughs> okay? So that's now fast forward to the current state and age, and this is a picture of three very important gentlemen. This is Dr. Ehrlich and Metnikov on the extremes of the picture, and in the center is Dr. Cooley. Cooley proposed um, many, many, many years ago that there was something called immune therapies, and that he could say that patients could get a febrile episode to treat their cancer, and that that will increase their uh, fight against their tumors from within them with what he used to call febrile antigens and a lot of different things, the Coolidge cocktail. I still get patients that come to my office and ask me if they can get a Coolidge cocktail. <laughs> Medicine at that time completely criticized Cooley. His two co-authors went on to win the Nobel Prize and Cooley was called a quack and that nobody knew what he was talking about and that he was absolutely crazy. Has anyone heard about immunotherapy nowadays today? Everybody. Has anyone heard about Ehrlich and Metnikov? Probably not, none of us. So this is interesting because it's taking that there is knowledge to be acquired from a lot of these different things. Now, I'm going to be going back and forth on these type of things. It's, not, it's important to say that it's not easy when I have to navigate when a patient comes to my office and tells me, okay, I want to get the Coolidge cocktail, which I don't do. I don't do the Coolidge cocktail. The Coolidge cocktail had kind of like some rational, we've got better drugs nowadays that are just the immunotherapies that we're using and that you see in every single sports game that you're tuning and it's like ask your doctor about all these medications, which are the immunotherapies that are based a lot in, in Coolidge theories, but are better purified and better done. So there are legal implications when the patients come and ask me to give them a Coolidge cocktail. And this is a case that it was on uh, the case of the New York court of uh, Gonzalez, that it was a doctor that was using some different techniques that included some coffee enemas and things like that, that we've done the studies. Don't get, don't get me wrong. I'm, I don't take this in a non-critical fashion. We spent actually $3 million of the good money of your taxes at the National Institute of Health to prove that the therapy that Gonzalez was proposing was not active. So we did try it. And the, but the legal implication and the court said, and you can say that it's well settled, that if you walked into my office and tell me I want the coffee enemas, I want to get this, your consent or insistence in me using that treatment does not relieve me as a physician from the obligation of treating you with the standard of care and advocating for you in the best scientific fashion. So I do have my license on the line when I'm talking about these type of things. And the court actually was against Gonzalez. So 
that's part of the reason. Now, you also walked into a lot of the supermarkets and you said like, oh my God, but I see all these supplements. I see all these medications that are FDA approved. Remember what FDA stands for. FDA stands for Food and Drug Administration. Has anyone seen an FDA sign of approval in the apple that you buy at the supermarket? No, because that's what the FDA is regulating. So for the FDA, when you go into the pharmacy and you get a bottle of ginger, which I use all the time on, with my patients, or turmeric, for the FDA, that was the same as if you would have picked up a root of ginger, because there is no difference in between a packaged ginger in a, in a pill or in a tablet, or a powder turmeric or a root of curcumin or turmeric, which is the same, for the FDA, that's just food. So it is a regulatory agency. When I did research with some fruits to improve taste alterations on patients with chemotherapy and all that, and I called the FDA to get an investigational number for the fruits that I was investigating, they said, are you gone out of your mind? And they put me in contact, and I'm like, listen, I do research with the most toxic chemotherapy known to man, but now I want to do research with fruits. And the guy said, like, what do you want us to do with you? I'm like, I don't know, I need you to give me what is called an IND, that is an investigational new drug for the fruit that I plan to investigate. So they put me on the phone with two regulators at the FDA, and one of the regulators said, like, you don't need that. You don't need to get an IND for apples. And then the second regulator said, like, oh, hold on one second. Are you wanting to prove that an apple a day keeps the doctor away? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I want to prove that an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And he said, is the patient planning to eat that apple that day or not? And, he's, and I said, no, because I'm planning to randomize the patients. Like, you eat apples, you don't eat apples. And the, and the second regulator said, like, you need an IND. And it took me 10 times more work to get an IND for an investigation of a fruit than what it takes me to get for an investigation of a poison. It is, it is insane, but I got it. And, and it's, to my knowledge, it's the first time that an IND has been given to a natural product, and, which is, I'll talk later on cannabis, but that's a different story, but that's what it is. The reason that they're in Whole Foods, and in all that I don't want to advertise any place, but in all the supermarkets, all those supplements are because they're regulated under the FDA. What it is not legal is if you pick up a bottle in one of those supermarkets and the bottle says, like, this is intended to cure cancer. That is the Federal Trade Commission and regulates false advertisement. Because until I did the study with my fruits and I proved that the fruits are beneficial to treat, to treat certain things, and I proved them and I put them at the same rigorous evaluation as I put the, the uh, medications and the poisons that I'm, that I'm testing, then I can make that claim, okay? And I challenge you. Like I, I, have to disclose, I was involved with a supplement company before the pandemic. We decided to close it after the, during the pandemic just for different reasons. But that supplement company, we were with five teams of lawyers to make sure that we did not violate anything with the Federal Trade Commission. Because we did not want to say the patients what it was not true. We were looking at those supplements for different things and we were not advertising anything. Now, let's go back to what is Integrative, on integrative medicine. This is, believe it or not, a list that I compiled on a plane when I was going to give a lecture on this topic somewhere abroad, and I started saying, like, let's just put a list of all the things that are seen in my practice as common practices of integrative medicine. And this is, like, honestly, of the top of my head on a plane that I was putting all this. But summarizing it, what it is, it really goes into these um, six issues, nutrition, mind and body practices, manipulation practices, spirituality, energy practices, and whole body systems, which is Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine, which you see that they overlap. Because like when I'm talking with a patient about some Ayurvedic medicine, they could have turmeric, which is part of nutrition. So they overlap, and, and, and the physical aspect, like of physical activity and all that, could be considered part of manipulation if I tell a patient like stretch before your chemo and kind of like be ready to receive your chemo and all that stuff could also be conceived as a relaxation technique with, uh, with mind and body practices. So they overlap all of them. I'm going to touch very superficially in all of them. And you see that they overlap even with the standard medical techniques with surgery all the way down at the bottom. That is a manipulation. I'm manipulating your stomach to just not drain in the same way so that you go and get a proper nutrition when the part of your stomach that was not working needs to be removed. So I don't do surgery, I do, I do uh, 
chemo and, and all that stuff. Let's start with nutrition. So nutrition is something that, that it's quite important. And uh, this is a picture that I got when we did a campaign and the photographer, uh, Kiko, uh, allowed me to use his uh, photography. And this is the modern kitchen. You go and you pick up a hamburger and what you're getting is those nutrition facts with all those chemical additives and all that stuff. And I always tell the patients, if you cannot read and pronounce what you're getting on the, on the ingredient list, don't eat it because it's not good. Now, the problem is that actually, believe it or not, this year, 35% of the people that walk into my office to be treated for their cancers have been caused by their diet. It surpassed smoking. Obesity has surpassed smoking and the, as the number one cause of cancer preventable illness over the past few years. Yes. So, and it's both. It's what we eat, but also what we don't eat, okay? So, that gets us back to philosophy, into like, into a lot of this. And it, uh, Maimonides, that was a, a Jewish philosopher and physician of uh, many decades ago, uh, centuries ago, he said that no illness that can be treated by diet should be treated by any other means. Which means that when you guys go and say like, oh no, I have high cholesterol. How many people have had high cholesterol, walked into the cardiology office and they just give them a pill instead of telling them, like, what are you eating? And that's what we're talking. And it's also because we have come to believe that the essential food groups are alcohol, caffeine, sugar, and fat, instead of the normal uh, groups. Now, let's go into a time travel. So this is the obesity trends uh, on slides that I got from the Center for Disease Control over the past decades. So this is 1985. Uh, what it says there, body mass index of more than 30, it means that the people that have that body mass index of more than 30 qualify for a gastric bypass to reduce their weight or that they have what is considered an obesity level in this setting. So if we're talking about this from 1985, you see that there are some few states with 10 to 14% of the patients having obesity that would qualify them for surgical interventions and all that. Let's go, let's go and see what happened in this country over the past few years. 86, 87, we keep moving, 89. Look at this, half of the country. Oh, look at that, darker color. We've got states now with 15 to 19. Uh, yeah, and you see, and it keeps moving. We're, we're, we're the whole country getting nice colors, very dark colors, new colors. 20%, one of every five people that we meet in those states qualifies for a gastric bypass, and we're not even close to today. Look at this. This is what has been happening over the country. The only state that is keeping up light blue will be the, to the topic of my second part of the lecture, which is Colorado. So cannabis may have something to do, but look at our neighbors. 25%, one in four in the, in the orange states qualifies for a gastric bypass. 2003, darker, 30%, one of every three people that we meet in those states will qualify for a gastric bypass. Colorado holding strong, you see that? But, and this is 2008, 2009, 2010. And guess what? 2011, the Center for Disease Control said, like, that's it, we're calling it a day. Let's just ask people, do you think that you're fat or not? And just self-report your weight. So the data from 2000, and you know how that goes. That's almost the same as self-report your age. But the, the data of 2010 changed to self-reported because the CDC said, like, we've had it. So the data that I'm going to show you now from 2010 to 2022, look at this. There's states where 40% of the population, one out of every other person that you cross at the supermarket qualifies for a gastric bypass. That's the reason that we're seeing the cancer epidemic. And that's where you see that these stores disappeared. When I first moved here to this country from Colombia, I used to see uh, a lot of these stores all over, big and tall. And yes, there's a lot of very tall basketball players that need their clothes, but there used to be a lot of big people. And now you find these at the regular stores. It's, it's not anymore. So that's because of the standard American diet or the SAT diet, which is not good. And the problem with the SAT diet is that we take something beautiful like this 
green field of wheat that is drying up and that we're getting those kernels of wheat and we're manipulating them until we get them into a very refined product that becomes a white powder. Now, this is not the Colombian white powder. This is, no, so don't, don't think that this is because a, a Colombian is speaking. But you see the difference in between eating, in between eating that very refined wheat flour versus an unrefined wheat product that could be used to prepare the same type of products. And what that entails is that you're getting an area of processing and surface area in your gut that will absorb more of that calorie count that will increase your um, glycemic index, which is the spike of your blood sugar. That increases the amount of insulin production. That increases inflammation and probably tumor production. So we need to be much more cognitive of how we use our foods. And this is a slide that when I went to another lecture in South America to talk about this topic, somebody said like, oh, I got a picture to share with you. And this was actually from a place in Chile that they sent me this picture. This is what we should be getting. We should be directing our patients, like, okay, I need you to go to the pharmacy. I need you to pick up three broccolis, five uh, lettuces, and things like that, instead of telling them, uh, like, go and get low cholesterol uh, medications. And the problem is that people come into my office with this type of things. This is a picture that I took from a patient that brought me all the supplements to discuss in one of my integrative medicine consultations, and the patient was rolling all those supplements. When I evaluated the patient, the doctors that were treating the patient were having tremendous trouble treating the calcium levels because the patient was having all the time very, very high calcium levels. And the patient was taking huge doses of vitamin D and extra calcium like by the gallon that the moment that I stopped them, the calcium got better. It was not the cancer that was increasing the calcium. It was the patient that was just increasing. So you have to realize that we need to take all those supplements and a lot of those different things, the way that it was said in, in Forbes magazine, that it's like taken in your reports of disease-preventing vitamins with a grain of salt. When, those, when this is all sorted out, it um, will be that you need to take 50 or 60 different nutrients to get a real benefit. That is a possibility. It's called broccoli. Cruciferous vegetables will have much more supplement power than a lot of the different things that I show you in a single bottle. And the problem is also the concentration. And we've done these studies. Don't get me wrong. It's not that I take this uncritical. We participated in this study at Sinai in which we're looking at multivitamin and mineral supplementation for prevention of, uh, this was for lung cancer. Guess what we did? We increased lung cancer incidence. Why? Because the antioxidants and some of these vitamins are great when we want to look young, don't have wrinkles, have, have our cells survive better and have kind of like an anti-aging effect. Have you ever heard about killing cancer cells? We protected the cancer cells. So the patients that were smokers, that were having much more risk of developing cancer, end up developing more cancer when they took multivitamins than when they didn't. And we did the same study in prostate cancer with selenium and vitamin E. We did the same study in many different situations. It has never been proven that mega doses of certain vitamins will be beneficial. And the other problem is that what people take and they think that it's natural, it's uh, not always healthy or it could have some unwarranted consequences. Like, and like my wife hates to go with me to any store because I'm looking at labels and I'm looking at all these different things. So the one day we were at Home Depot and there were all these seeds and I started looking at the seeds and I saw this beautiful plant called foxglove that you can see that it does grow actually in some areas in Florida. Beautiful flowers that some people may say like, oh my God, I'm going to make tea out of those flowers. You know what foxglove is? Foxglove, um, naming the scientific word, is actually... Uh, digitalis purpurea, which is from those beautiful flowers is what we derive a drug that is used in cardiology that is called digoxin. And digoxin is highly toxic at high levels. So don't, don't get any ideas that because the flower may be nice and all that. I, I, it's funny because at some point I wanted to grow in my, in my garden a type of uh, ginseng that I, because I couldn't get American ginseng and I thought that I could grow it here. And one of my nurses told me like, oh, I got a ginseng for you. And she brought me a ginseng. I started growing it and it started growing. And I said like, this doesn't look too much like the ginseng that I know. And I started sending it to try to get it identified. And I tend to be a pain in the neck to some of the people at the University of Florida and, and all these other places that I sent to for identification. And they tell me like, oh, no, no, that's actually a 
Buddha belly ginseng, something like that. And the, and the guy tells me, like, just be careful. It's super toxic if you consume it. <laughs> like, and it was just a very beautiful ginseng. And ginseng is like that. American ginseng is different than Korean ginseng and is different than the Siberian ginseng, which is not a ginseng. It's Eleuthero. So you got to know your plants. You got to know. And this is the reason that you have to be with somebody that, that, when, that is giving you good advice and not just anyone that will tell you, like, oh, take these vitamins, take these things. Because besides that, they interact heavily with the current medications. This is just a big list of interactions of cytochrome enzymes are the way that we manipulate all the drugs in the liver. So all the drugs that are metabolized by the liver get this cytochrome activity. All these inducers and inhibitors are natural products. St. John's Worth, uh, whatever you want to call it. Like there's tons, cat's claw, and they could interfere with the way that you work out medications in your liver. The other problem is that they, there's a lot of limitations of botanical research. Because when you're looking at the botanical research, you, ne you need to look at the lack of a standardization. It is not the same when somebody tells me, oh, I've got a product that is isolated from this supplement or something like that, and the plants could have different names, like the ginseng that I just told you. But also what part of the plant is, is used? Like, who will drink a glass of wine made with the leaves of the plant? And it's the same product. You're getting a, you're getting a product that is derived from the vine, uh, which is the same plant, it is completely different that if you use the, the aerial parts, the root parts, the same happens with the ginseng. You will not like to take a ginseng out of the small leaves that the ginseng can flourish. You want to get the root. So that happens with everything. All the products that we use, we need to know what are we using, what concentrations, what doses. The doses of like resveratrol are very difficult because a bottle of resveratrol it has the equivalent of 600 bottles of wines, of wine in one single bottle. So you, you got to be careful with, with saying like, oh, a glass of wine is the same as taking resveratrol. I don't know. And then the difficulty in controlling the placebo group. If I tell you I'm going to do a study of controlling nausea with ginger, uh, but I need you to be either on the placebo group or the control arm. And the person is like, I'm having nausea. I'm, I'm walking into the store and getting ginseng because I may be getting the placebo group which is different than when I'm giving chemotherapy. When I'm giving chemotherapy, I know that the patient that is getting the chemo is getting the chemo in my office and nothing else. With the control arm of botanical research, it's very difficult. And then you get all these reports that are super, super deceiving, in which the statistics are completely, completely false. And, and like, like this one, like statistics shows that teen pregnancy drops after the age of 25, <laughs> when they're not teen anymore. Yeah, that, that's a good way. Let's switch gears to mind and body medicine. So the previous speaker was talking a little bit of meditation, mindfulness, and all that stuff. That is the easiest, cheapest, and most amazing thing that anyone can do. And not if you have cancer or not, everybody should do it. And it is the greater to think that we can separate our body from our mind because it is connected. And there's a lot of techniques that go from meditation, guided imagery that I use with my patients before surgery. I tell them, like, listen, there's tapes that you can see. There's actually studies that have been shown that patients that use guided imagery to direct blood flow away from the surgical site <coughs> during surgery require less transfusions in pancreatic cancer surgery. And that's just as simple as listening to a tape and, I'm, and that, re that kind of like repeats and kind of like says, like, I will help the surgeon while I'm sleeping during my surgery. And it sounds like a quack. And it did, and it was proven. Wow. Does it work? I don't know. Does it harm? Absolutely not. <laughs> like, and the same, and the same with, like, all the meditation and relaxation. Does it harm anyone to just tell you, like, take a few good mindfulness, good deep breaths before going to bed, and feel your body get connected, and then go to go to rest? How much am I spending, and how much am I harming? And believe it or not. We've done studies for that. And they have shown actually that it decreases cortisol levels, which are inflammatory levels, which is the same that I do when I give the patient steroids. Mm. Just by telling the patient, be mindful. Okay? Now, quick topic on, on uh, traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture and uh, whole body system. Um, they are, they're across cultures. People think that when I'm talking about acupuncture and the meridians and things like that, they are just on the level of uh, traditional Chinese medicine. <coughs> Multiple <coughs> cultures 
had these writings over 5,000 years ago. The Christian sacraments, the Jewish sefirot, and the Indian chakras, look how they correlate. In between the, the, in the chakras, the crown, the solar plexus, the sacral plexus, and in the sephirot, the nether, the different things, they all are connected. And, they, and don't try to find connection in between all these cultures. They were in different times. And when you look even at touching on the different meridians, there is data to suggest that therapeutic touch, which could be as simple as hand-holding. This is the biggest thing that I have a bone to pick with the, with the current medical education in this country, that we're getting this proliferation of PhDs and scientists being the deans of medical schools. And I always tell them, like, until you hold the hand of a dying patient, don't tell me how to treat a patient. Don't tell me that the mouse that you treated in the laboratory and because you proved that immunotherapy is the CTL4 pathway and all that stuff is more important than just holding a hand. This is therapeutic touch. And this is useful. Now, how do we do research with this? In the, like, there are studies that have been done of intercessory prayer, of going to church groups and telling the churches, like, tell your church to pray for your recovery. How do you control that? How do you control that, Sadiq? Do I tell people, okay, now you do me a favor and go and tell your church to pray that you don't get better? Who will do that? And then does it matter who's praying? The pet that is not getting fed by the owner because it's sick? Or do you have to pray in a special place like the Western Wall? Or do you need to get a chain letter so that you get thousands and thousands of people? So this is our people that we have in our office. We get our pet therapy. It took me a lot of time to convince my administration to let neutropenic patients, meaning with no immune systems when they're getting chemotherapy, to allow this little fellow to jump into their beds and be with them so that we can have a little bit of some um, pet therapy. Now, let's switch gears, and I keep watching to make sure that we have enough time, but I'm going to try to run a little bit more on medicinal cannabis. So, is that grass? Yes, and believe it or not, Marijuana has been, and cannabis has been present in traditional medicine forever. This is the, the grave of a healer in China uh, from God knows what year, but he had these little seeds next to him in a small bowl of a substance that they used to call in traditional Chinese medicine dama, which is cannabis. Okay? Believe it or not, cannabis has been used, and I'm just using this as a, as a way of showing you how like some integrative medicine could go into real medicine and all that, but it's been used for more than 3,000 years. And it was the number one product that was used in the medical pharmacopoeia in the 1800s. And it used to be done for sedative analgesia and all that. The, the extracts of marijuana and hashish, which is the same, were the number one, number two, and number three most prescribed products in medical literature in the, in the 18, uh, uh, 40 to 1990. The problem was that, that with the onset of prohibitionist and then the decrease in prohibition, this fellow, uh, Mr. Eisler, that was in our Congress, decided to take over with a new uh, type of uh, target after they decreased prohibition and they decided to start putting it out of favor. Now, part of the problem with marijuana was that also there were products that were better, like barbiturates, opiates for pain and all that. But what it, they started to create is the listing it in the 1940s at the end of prohibition and in congress this is taken from the files of our great united states congress they put in that prohibition that marijuana is the most violence causing drug of history of mankind most marijuana smokers are negroes hispanics filipinos entertainers their satanic music jazz and swing results from the marijuana usage from the files of Congress, it is there. Wow. Yes. So, and they created the National Institute of Drug Addiction, and they listed marijuana as a Schedule One, which means Schedule One and Schedule Two are the way that we list some substances that may have addictive potential. And Schedule One means that it's got no proven medical use for anything, and that's where marijuana still, to this day, is listed. Okay, with heroin, LSD, and a lot of other substances. Schedule two, instead, no, that's a schedule two. Fentanyl is schedule two, which means that it's highly addictive, but it does have um, a use. Now, it still is under federal law. 
and it still has control. Like when I'm, I tried to do two, two research studies with marijuana, and they directed me that I needed to go and get the permit, not from the FDA for my IND, like what I did with my other fruits, but they said you need to go to NIDA. Try to go to NIDA. I've been talking with NIDA for the past five years and trying to get some studies done here in Florida. I require a different license that is higher than my medical license to be able to do research with marijuana because the Supreme Court has said that it is not an excuse to break the law, even if it has been with medical proven. And in, the two, in 2006, the FDA affirmed again that marijuana is not a medication. Now, this is marijuana. The problem with marijuana is that it's got, and cannabis, we should call it more scientifically, but because actually the term marijuana was also done as part of kind of like satanizing the marijuana to put it into a more Hispanic name, so it keeps getting back to me, but, they, but, they, <laughs> but they, the, the way that they, that they kind of like try to uh, put it is just all together. Now, the cannabis has over 400 chemical compounds that go from del delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid and all the terpenes, flavonoids, a lot of the different things. And there's three types, sativa, indica, and ruderalis. They're completely different plants, as what I was telling you. And in between using it, vaporized edibles, it's very different. The drugs behave different. When you vaporize it and when you, when you inhale, it's got very short half-lives, but when you eat it, the edibles could be a little bit more dangerous. I tend to be much more in the, in the boat of preferring a drug that has peaks instead of this long effect, but there's use for both. And there's receptors of marijuana that um, Raphael Meshulan in Israel described many years ago. He was like the father of research with marijuana. But this is, this is something interesting. There's CB1 and CB2 receptors, and there's a lot of CB2 receptors in the immune system. There's now a lot of studies looking at interaction in between cannabis and our immunotherapies, but the uh, problem that we're seeing is that the doses that we're seeing are extremely high. The cannabis that we see in the market nowadays is not the cannabis of the 70s and the 80s. We're seeing extremely high doses. We used to consider low THC, 7 milligrams, medium 7 to 18, and high 18. It's tough to get now preparations, and I always take field trips when I travel around the country to give lectures in the states where it's completely legal and that I can walk into the dispensaries just to see what they have. Most of the times I'm finding very high doses, and the, the very high doses could have a lot of different effects on the other systems, including hormonal systems uh, and a lot of the other um, side effects. And this is the studies that have been done with immunotherapy, also from the group uh, from Israel, that there may be an interaction. We're still not on the, on the full fledge of knowing where this is going, but we're, I'm trying to prevent a little bit my patients that are in active immunotherapies from using indiscriminately the uh, cannabis because there could be that interaction of decreasing the levels. Now, is it toxic? No, because when you look at the therapeutic index, besides getting the, the risk of some hallucinations, tachycardia, which is a rapid heart rate, and a little bit of uh, drowsiness, the therapeutic window of morphine and some of the other components, it is in favor of cannabis. And you can see that it's actually much more toxic alcohol than cannabis, okay? And this is the way that it is, that the deaths in, uh, from alcohol and the deaths from cigarettes, and there's not a single dead reported from cannabis. Wow. Not a single dead reported from overdose of cannabis, even on the high level of dosing. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that you can do stupidity. Obviously, don't, don't, drive, don't drive high, don't, they, whatever they, they call it, and all that stuff, but that's just from the conscious level. But what we're talking of, deaths from alcohol, are overdose from alcohol, and the deaths from cigarettes are obviously from cancer. Now, the, the dependency level, which is the other thing. A lot of people tell me, like, oh, cannabis is a, is a stepping stone drug where people will consume cannabis, and from there they'll move on to stronger things. Not proven. It is not the case. The lifetime dependency of cannabis. And that you see it. Like, who, who didn't try cannabis in college and who's still smoking cannabis on a regular basis? And even the people that in college used to be much more frequent users, do they continue to use it later, later on in life? No. But for whoever of us that was a former smoker, you know how difficult it is to quit smoking. So that's where it goes. And the same goes for the other ones, and that includes alcohol. It's got a less dependency level than alcohol. And there's a lot of things that we're investigating. There's tons and tons of things that we're looking as research goes on. 
I did this a few years ago. I didn't update this slide for this lecture, but I, in the medical literature, I looked for cannabis articles, and there were 17,000 articles. When I looked at cannabis and cancer, there were 517. When I filtered to real clinical trials, there were 19 studies. And the NIDA still does not let us do a lot of research on this. Now, the problem is that it's still, it's got a lot of different uh, plants and a lot of different groups. It's very difficult to standardize, very difficult to control inhalation of how do you inhale enough and do you get the same doses and then the contaminations and the psychoactive effect. But the biggest problem is that it's not patented. So for anyone that can grow a product in their, in their backyard, how do we get that research to have the uh, support of groups that will be able to allow us to do much more. Here in Florida, it is legal on the compassionate medical cannabis use. I was one of the first 100 people in the state to be allowed to prescribe it after I did my $999 certification <laughs> course. I'm not kidding you. It, is, it, it, was, it was pathetic. It was pathetic because it, it was pathetic because I did it at an airport while I was waiting to board a plane. I got certified to, to prescribe cannabis. <laughs> and, and it cost me $1,000. My medical license cost less than that to renew it, but the compassionate medical use cost me more because I had to do this class. And the test, I, I had on a previous slide with some of the questions of the test, and they asked me to remove them because it was illegal that I reproduced the test. But, it, but, the, the, but the questions were like, one of the following products, it is not related to cannabis, and it was like olive oil, grapes, uh, marijuana, and the, other, and the other one was Tylenol. You're like, what type of question is that on a medical test? It, 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 but that's the way that it was. The second problem, and the reason that I'm not doing it anymore, is because the hospital where I work said, you cannot do, prescribe marijuana anymore because the federal government and the state of Florida requires me to get consent from the patient when I prescribe cannabis. And most people that prescribe it don't look at the legality and don't have a hospital lawyer behind them in which it says that I need to ask the patients for all this information. And part of this, it says that if the patient ends up in a car accident, after I prescribe marijuana, I'm partially responsible because I prescribed the product. I don't have to get that consent when I give the patient morphine. But I have to get the consent for the potential side effect of, of uh, cannabis. And at the end of the day, I talked about nutrition and I talked about cannabis. And you see, it's way, way better to probably consume the cannabis than the Coca-Cola. I'm not saying anything about a brand, but the, 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 the refined carbohydrates. And yeah, I don't know if you can read well, but it says there that one of the two products is sold in schools, well, legally sold in schools, both of the products are sold in schools, but, but, what, but, but one, of the, one of the products is sold in vending machines, let's put it that way, in high schools, the other one is considered illegal, one will give you cancer, the other one doesn't give you much, and one will give you uh, tons and tons of inflammation, and it's produced with highly refined corn syrup, while the other one is very naturally grown. So. Summarizing and to leave some time for questions, this is the way that I like to summarize that you have to be careful with what you do. Everything is go, goes to really controlling your weight, healthy eating, use appropriately all the supplements, get regular physical activity, we didn't touch much on that, stress reduction with breathing, guided imagery, self-hypnosis, connect with family and friends. Spirituality is not religion. Spirituality is, means that people could be spiritual about their kids. They could be spiritual about their day-to-day uh, -day, uh, basis. And I always tell my residents when they're rotating with me that they have that healing presence and that before they move from one patient room to the other one, they have to do this. They have to breathe in, breathe out all that they've been thinking out, breathe in again and letting it go, allow the body to relax. And this is the doctor that I'm telling him to do this. And take one more breath into your heart feel that healing presence, and then go back and greet the next patient. And again, I'm saying that a lot of this is not fully proven. But in an era where medicine is supposed to be evidence-based, I think that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That if I don't have a way that I can prove a patient that an apple a day keeps the doctor away, I also don't have a way to prove it that it is not true. And if it's not harmful to tell the patient, listen, eat healthy fruits and vegetables, 
that's the way that it should be. And the risk of the intervention is what should prove the level of evidence. That when I'm testing the next poison, the next chemotherapy in my office, I need a randomized controlled phase three clinical trial. But when I'm telling a patient, do me a favor and hug your kids every morning, I don't need a, cl a clinical trial for that. So with that, I'll be more than glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kuzner, for uh, your information. Um, I would like to take a moment and present you with an award for coming out today on your Saturday and um, all that you do for our community. So let me find you here. Thank you, Thank you no, Dr. No, Kuzner. Thank you. I'd like Thanks. to take a picture with you. <laughs>